Hello, everybody. Welcome and thank you for joining in for today's talk. I'm John Varghese, board member for the Center for Inquiry Canada. I would like to begin by acknowledging the indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on. Though we meet today on a virtual platform, from coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral territory of all the Inuit, Métis, and the First Nations people. We also acknowledge that not all people came to these lands as migrants and settlers. We wish to recognize those of us who came here involuntarily, particularly those brought to these lands as a result of the transatlantic slave trade and human trafficking. And we pay tribute to those ancestors and their descendants. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations, to improving our understanding of local indigenous peoples and their cultures, to acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and to consider how we can each in our own way, try to move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. CFIC is an educational charity promoting human rights, science, and critical thinking. In order to support this work, our operation relies on funds from memberships and donations. If you can help even a little, please visit our website at centerforinquiries.ca. The URL is posted in the chat window. All donations, of course, are tax receivable. As we go through today's presentation, we will be accepting written questions using the Zoom chat feature, which you can find at the bottom of your Zoom window. The expectation, of course, is that all participants are respectful of the speakers and other audience members. Well, with those announcements out of the way, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our guest for today, Alex, Alex McIsaac, Executive Director for World Federalist Movement Canada. Welcome, Alex. Hi, thank you, John. WFM is a non not-for-profit research, education, and advocacy organization that aims to find the means, the legal and political structures to adequately and democratically address global problems. Alex, of course, will share more information on WFM as he presents his talk today on building a world community. Growing up following his parents' work in international development and living in countries like Nepal, India, Bolivia, among others, Alex has always been committed to establishing a democratic world community. He has participated in and founded various political groups and students, student clubs throughout his collegial, undergraduate, and graduate studies, the Debating League of Mississauga, and Global Federalist Association being a couple of examples. Alex's drive for world federalism is mixed with a nonpartisan approach to politics, balanced with the respect for national and local sovereignty. Having worked at Elections Canada over the last few years, dealing directly with candidates and political parties, Alex is most passionate about projects targeted towards establishing and reforming global democratic systems, which seems to be a pretty pressing need of the hour. So without further delay, I'd like to hand over the space, so to speak, to Alex. Alex? Thank you. Um, should I start uh, my presentation right now? Or... Absolutely. Okay. All yours. Just uh, share my screen right now. Um, so yeah, thank you for the wonderful introduction. Um, I am Alexander McIsaac, as uh, I was introduced. Um, I'm the executive director of the World Federalist Movement Canada. Um, World Federalist Movement Canada, we're an organization. Uh, we um, advocate for uh, this concept called world federalism, which uh, is basically um, a political ideology which advocates for the establishment of a world government, which would be democratically elected. So um, very much mimicking the United Nations uh, General Assembly, but uh, with a direct channel to uh, the citizens that it um, oversees. So, uh, of course, uh, we're advocating for a world government, but that does not mean that um, world federalists um, want to abolish nation states. On the contrary, that's where the principle of federalism comes in, and we uh, would like to see some sort of uh, federal structure at the global level, the same way we see it uh, a lot within nation states, the way we divide um, certain jurisdictions based on municipalities, provinces, uh, territories or uh, countries, we would then have another level, which would be a uh, global level. 
And that global level, it's uh, very important that I note that its powers would have to be very constitutionally limited so that it doesn't, uh, you know, uh, go over and step on the uh, national sovereignty of nation states at the same time. Uh, so, yeah, we'll be looking at a lot of examples of what um, types of projects and what types of reforms world federalists would advocate for uh, to make the um, world community more democratic and, as the topic of this presentation is, eventually build a world community. So uh, the, uh, the EU, or the European Union, sorry, uh, would be a great example, actually, of world federalism in practice. Uh, we've seen uh, the European Union expand. Um, you know, over the past decades. And uh, what it does is it establishes that kind of principle of federalism where nation states agree to give uh, away certain um, or alleviate some of their jurisdiction and grant it to, you know, European uh, officials. So um, if, for example, the Schengen area, that would really deal with the movement of people. And uh, that is actually something that populists target, which we'll see down the line. Uh, I'd also like to note that, you know, uh, there's um, a lot of criticisms, of course, about uh, the European Union's excessive uh, bureaucracy, and uh, that is also something that plays in often into uh, critiques of world federalist uh, proposals. So um, that's also going to be a theme that we're going to see uh, throughout this presentation. So um, why is world federalism more important than ever? Um, what we're seeing nowadays is um, the world community is very much uh, approaching trends that we've seen uh, prior to World Wars One and Two. So one thing that we can't, uh, often forget is that uh, near the end of the 19th century, uh, the world was very globalized um, and there were very few restrictions on the movement of goods, um, the movement of people and the movement of capital. So. Um, Harold James, who wrote uh, The End of Globalization, with a question mark, of course, um, had this, uh, he made a, he did an analysis, and looking at the volumes, he saw that the world only really reached this level of globalization that we had in the 19th century, by the time we reached um, near the year 2000. So we're really only reaching that level of globalization, which nationalist populists set themselves up against prior to World War I and II, we're reaching that in the last few decades only. And not coincidentally, we are seeing a lot of populist movements uh, rising around the world now. So um, these populist movements often set themselves up against you know, world federalism. So uh, against the European Union, they set them up as this kind of super national elite and they are the targets for all of these criticisms. And yeah, it's the fuel to take back this national sovereignty and become an absolute national sovereign state. So uh, yeah, uh, populists or national populists tend to attack uh, these uh, waves of globalization uh, in three ways. So for migration, they you know, uh, uh, bring up borders. So immigration policy, uh, they have restrictions on trade and uh, a lot of uh, protectionism involved. Another uh, common trend we see with uh, nationalist populists is they tend to impose restrictions on capital movements. Another problem with uh, nationalists is that they tend to be uh, very authoritarian and centralize the state apparatus around them in order to protect that absolute national sovereignty against that supposed global elite that they target. That's very destructive, and that is uh, commonly cited as one of the big reasons why we had, you know, a lot of um, nationalist populists like uh, Adolf Hitler, uh, Mussolini, and you know these uh, characters coming together actually create world wars, and they are very dangerous for the international community. Uh, and another uh, final point, actually, is that um, nationalists tend to have a very similar logic as world federalists, ironically. Although uh, we both see the same ills in the international structure. So the inter uh, world federalists argue for democratic reforms to make the, uh, our global governance structure more democratic. In the same vein, nationalist populists also attack this global elite. They just have a different prescription for it. So we identify the same ills, but we have different prescriptions. 
whereas we want to reform international institutions to make them more democratic and then uh, regulate globalization in a way. They prefer to just erect these borders and close off everything and move away from globalization. So this is something that we uh, is very important because globalization we tend to see as this linear stream, but uh, actually it comes in waves. Of course, communication and uh, like technology for communication, technology for transportation keeps on going up. So globalization does have a somewhat upwards stream uh, that is, but it's not necessarily linear because of those policies that nationalist populists can put in place and like uh, bring down all this progress that we've made. So yes, um, moving on um, to uh, the next uh, step, I'm just gonna go over uh, the history of the movement just a bit. Just trying to move the uh, screen away. Okay. So yeah, uh, the World for, uh, Federalist Organization. So it's uh, now called uh, World Federalist Movement uh, for Institute uh, or Institute for Global Policy. So WFM IGP. It was founded in 1937, and that was a time which was plagued with nationalist populism uh, and, in most cases, fascist movements around the world. So uh, over time and discussions around the formation of the United Nations as they concretized into its current defined structure throughout and after World War II. The World Federalist Movement was, of course, shifting away from this idea of how this new international organization that followed the League of Nations should be formed to actually reforming what actually happened, which is the United Nations, of course. So, uh, and of course, as the United Nations has been concretized um, and we're not you know, looking to build a new international order in any way, um, we're just advocating for reforms on those and also its associated organizations or side organizations. Um, so uh, there's also a horizontal level here. Uh, so yeah, uh, there are organizations like the International Monitor, for example, which um, you know, the um, United States is known as having the only legitimate veto in that organization. That's another type of uh, democratic uh, deficiency that we identify in our international institutions. And uh, as you'll see, um, these uh, intergovernmental alliances like uh, NATO, uh, WTO, or the EU are often targets of uh, nationalist populists. So um, it, you'll see uh, things like Donald Trump uh, also going against um, trade deals like NAFTA um, and yeah, uh, Viktor Orban in Hungary on um, more domestic or like the EU's Schengen area uh, has been heavily criticized by um, Viktor Orban in Hungary. So um, although world federalism uh, has uh, kind of uh, diminished in its uh, popularity since the 1970s, um, uh, many people are now coming back to, uh, you know, finding out what it is and, and engaging in it and seeing it as a real uh, or a necessary perspective uh, for us to see how we can reshape the world. And uh, notable figures of this, of course, um, would include uh, Albert Einstein, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King uh, Jr. Uh, and uh, Albert Einstein, for example, um, you know, he was very concerned about um, nuclear weapons. And he didn't think that the uh, UN structure was able to actually prevent the proliferation of nuclear weapons. And us having the advantage of being almost a full century ahead of that, um, we see that he was right. You know, uh, the United Nations is not adequately equipped for that. And um, we will go over at the end uh, two proposals, uh, one for the um, reform of the United Nations General Assembly and one for the Security Council. And we'll see how um, there is a very big link there between the democratic legitimacy of the United Nations General Assembly and that being a big impediment on how it can actually achieve, um, you know, true efficiency in its policy and true respect by nation states for its policy. So uh, what does our organization do? So uh, World Federalist Movement Canada, of course, we are a member organization of WFMIGP. Uh, we, um, yeah, we're a not-for-profit uh, and we go into research, education, and advocacy. Uh, we have four branches, uh, one in Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, and Victoria. 
And uh, each of these branches all collaborate on uh, organizing events uh, and engaging in some of our projects, which I'll go over soon. So uh, we're non-state actors, of course. Um, we advocate for world federalism in multiple project areas, some of which engage state actors to take uh, positions on political matters, which is one of those uh, reforms that we're going to see, uh, which is uh, the United Nations Parliamentary Assembly. We also have, um, yeah, we also share uh, petitions here and there. Uh, from members of parliament. So we do engage with state actors uh, quite often. We reach out to them uh, to seek for their support for the endorsement of a um, United Nations Parliamentary Assembly. In terms of communication collaboration, we also regularly uh, communicate and collaborate with different organizations on projects of interest, uh, such as with Women, Peace and Security Network or uh, Better Climate Governance. Um, we also share petitions and initiatives launched by different groups uh, with our members. So uh, petitions for the Canadian uh, network to abol uh, uh, abolish nuclear weapons uh, was one of the recent ones we shared. So our project areas. Um, we have five project areas in uh, world federalism or at the World Federalist Movement Canada uh, to kind of uh, divide uh, uh, how we address uh, different areas of global governance. So these are different areas of global governance. And that's uh, basically how we break down um, our topic areas uh, to pique the interest of different uh, members. So some of our members are you know, nuclear uh, physicists. Uh, some of them are, uh, you know, some of them are very much engaged in peace and security. Others are uh, engaged uh, purely in, um, you know, environmental reforms. So the first one we're going to go over is uh, environmental justice. So um, this is our first stream, um, and you know, World Federalist Movement Canada, of course, acknowledges the dire need for international reforms so that we can actually achieve the targets that we establish at the UN. We think that um, the current United Nations is not efficient enough uh, and uh, doesn't have the democratic legitimacy to be able to tackle these environmental problems we face today. So we have uh, different project areas, such as a, a coordinated world carbon tax. Um, we have uh, coalitions for green energy as well. And uh, next one we'll look at is uh, global democracy, which is uh, my personal favorite and passion. So um, for global democracy, we have uh, two big projects, um, which are a campaign for a United Nations Parliamentary Assembly, which is going to be uh, one of the big topics I'm going to go into detail on. Uh, and we also, of course, advocate for increased transparency for the election of uh, UN representatives, which uh, UN representatives are, of course, appointed by nation states. So it doesn't have that direct channel to citizens. So uh, we advocate for more transparency and um, the inclusion of foreign affairs topics uh, in debates so that uh, the channel gets more direct and citizens actually vote for what we see happening at the UN. For peace and security, um, we have uh, three uh, different projects. We have, of course, one which deals with the responsibility to protect, which hasn't um, gotten that much attention, but it is very relevant because it shows how the UN typically fails because it depends on the political will of nation states. Um, it, we see that uh, a lot right now with the conflict in Ukraine, right, um, where um, we have uh, the uh, Uniting for Peace concept which uh, allows for um, the intervention in the conflict on a volunteer basis by nation states. But that, of course, falls into the problem of the political will of nation states. Uh, we have United Nations Security Council reform, which is the second one I'm going to go into detail on at the end of this presentation. And finally, we have the United Nations uh, Emergency uh, Peace uh, Service, so uh, Peacekeeping Service, sorry. And that is a sort of um, a proposal, uh, which uh, it varies a lot based on the different people advocating for this proposal, what it looks like, but typically it refers to some sort of uh, peacekeeping force, which would be going into a nation before any uh, unilateral action by any uh, nation state. So um, 
it's uh, not necessarily a military force, but it's a uh, more robust peacekeeping force, which would be sent uh, and very much ties to that responsibility to protect. Next, we have our Human Rights and Justice Division, um, and that advocates for um, various reforms to the International Criminal Court. We make uh, commentaries on decisions by the International Court of Justice. And of course, we have our own section uh, uh, or our own separate website, which tracks Canada's human rights uh, commitments. Finally, uh, we have the world economy uh, category. So the world economy category, we're looking at uh, different um, reforms to the Economic uh, Social and Development Council, uh, the World Trade Organization, the International Monetary Fund, as I mentioned, that veto issue. Um, and of course, global financial crises, such as the 2008 global financial crisis, which is a result actually of this uh, increase in globalization and the increasing and unstable uh, volatility of capital movements. So uh, capital movements moving out of a country very fast are, uh, is something that world federalists look at, but rather than address it like a populist would in terms of their prescription of just you know closing down all capital movements, we would look at you know, make um, different systems to make it so that a nation's capital moving out of its country would actually um, be some sort of like sanded off in a way. So this is the concept of the Tobin tax, where it's throwing sand in the wheels of the economy in a way by establishing a 0.02% uh, or 0.2, sorry, percent uh, tax on any financial transaction. There's also financial activities taxes that came out of that. So there are a lot of uh, proposals around there. Um, if uh, you're not familiar with James Tobin, I definitely uh, suggest that you look at his um, proposals. An interesting part of uh, the Tobin tax idea or financial activities tax is this would perhaps be a good venue to provide independent funding for a um, not world government, but United Nations parliamentary assembly, which would replace the United Nations General Assembly, so that they're not dependent on national government contributions. As we know, the budget of the UN fluctuates a lot, and it always uh, it also uh, puts in that power of nation states. The nation states that contribute more to the UN tend to have more power in the UN, and that's not really uh, that's a big blow to the democratic legitimacy of the organization. So. OK, so now. Um, Unless there are any questions, I'm going to go into detail on two of our proposals, um, but I'm going to take a bit of a pause to see if anyone has any questions at this point. Usually what we do is uh, we gather the questions and bring them to you towards the end. Alex? Okay. Sure. I'll just, uh, yeah, I'll move on to, uh, so our Security Council reform proposals. So. Um, as world federalism, you know, uh, we look at all the organizations or organs of the UN, really. But uh, the Security Council is known as, uh, you know, one of the prime organs of the UN alongside the United Nations General Assembly, especially the most efficient one, or the one with the most uh, capacity to be efficient. So it's the only body of the UN with what we call hard power, right, as opposed to soft power. So this is the idea that at the United Nations General Assembly, if you pass a resolution, um, and even if the state signs onto it, the only thing stopping them from backing out of that is not necessarily uh, any sort of punishment or sanction. They're, uh, they can just voluntarily withdraw from that, and the only thing there is shame. So at the United Nations Security Council, we actually see some sort of uh, directive which creates a sanction on a nation state, and it is binding in that way. So uh, the Security Council, um, something World Federalists, uh, you know, that they were very much against uh, prior to the formation of the UN or during the process of the formation of the UN, might I say, was um, how the United Nations Security Council currently tends to reflect the victors of World War II. So in that way, it's freeze-framed in post-World War II connections, uh, conditions, which is the basis of that institutional inertia that we see. So uh, 
as we know, like uh, the P5, the five permanent members of the UN, so uh, China, France, US, UK, and uh, Russia, are all the victors of World War II. And uh, having been freeze-framed, there is almost, well, there are venues, of course, in the UN Charter to change the composition of the United Nations Security Council, but those have to be approved by the Security Council. And since we know that nation states always act in their own interest in that uh, body, then we know that there is no actual possibility that those states would um, accept the entry of other nations to have veto power or absolve their own veto power, of course. Another note there is that all five permanent members, of course, are uh, nation states that own nuclear weapons. They have nuclear weapons in their positions, and they're not willing to give them up either. So that is a big blow also to the, any possibility of uh, realistic non-proliferation and uh, of nuclear weapons and disarmament of nuclear weapons too. So um, as world federalists, we'd, we'd see two considerations for reform, of course, uh, the efficiency uh, component and the democratic equity component. And of course, uh, as I mentioned earlier, these are both uh, very much tied to one another where uh, you need that kind of democratic legitimacy in order to be efficient and in order for nation states to listen to you or, um, uh, or, or to respect the decisions made by your body. So um, uh, we'll look at uh, two facets uh, of uh, reforms that uh, we would propose for the Security Council. One of them would be to uh, weaken the veto. So uh, weakening the veto, basically making it more efficient. If there is less of a chance for a, re a resolution passed at the Security Council to be vetoed, of course, then there's more chance that that body will be efficient in addressing any problem it addresses. So um, in terms of weakening the veto, we could either abolish the veto, which we already know is almost impossible. Um, we have, a, there is a proposal for two members of the permanent five. Uh, to vote against something for it to count as a veto. Uh, and there's also, um, yeah, uh, parties to dispute. So Article 27.3 of the UN Charter, basically limiting the power of the uh, uh, Security Council in the sense that if, if, uh, if one of the P5 is a party to the dispute, they have to abstain on a, a, that topic. But that only relates to uh, chapter six um, uh, article or uh, chapter six topics within the UN Charter. So uh, there are venues to kind of limit areas where uh, the P5 could also um, put in their veto. So uh, the veto, in that sense, for World Federalists, of course, is the biggest blow to uh, the efficiency of the Security Council, as we've seen recently with the uh, Security Council vote on. Russia, where Russia's uh, veto of the matter just completely uh, made the Security Council, or I don't want to say useless, because it did bring it to light, and it did bring the problem to light, but it didn't make it as efficient as it could be to actually stopping a problem. That, let's be realistic here, there is almost a consensus across the international community, or a near consensus. Another uh, facet of reforming the Security Council could be uh, expanding membership. So um, we have uh, the, um, the, the only expansion of non-permanent seats that we saw through a change to the UN Charter happened uh, in 1963, where we used to have 11 seats at the Security Council. Now we have 15. So uh, expanding membership would provide that democratic equity component. However, to a certain degree, if we expanded the membership of the UN, say, towards 20 members, yeah, we could have more uh, representation, right? And it would actually put more shame on these uh, P5 members uh, in terms of vetoing a resolution. So if they veto a resolution where 14 or 13 people agreed, uh, or 12 people agreed, sorry, uh, and two abstained, then it's not that uh, effective. But say there's almost a unanimous consensus where there's 19 members or 20 member, or like uh, 25 members say, of the Security Council that say yes, and one of them says no, that's a big blow to that country. So uh, that would be the idea in terms of expanding membership. But of course, there's a limit where if we expand membership too much to say like 
100 members uh, added in as non-permanent, then it uh, also, you know, creates this process of deliberations, which makes it less efficient at the same time. So uh, that's it for the Security Council reform um, in terms of uh, our perspectives on how world federalism would uh, play into looking at the Security Council. The next one is um, one of our biggest projects, actually. It's uh, our campaign for a United Nations Parliamentary Assembly, which looks at uh, reforming the United Nations General Assembly. So this is the concept where uh, you know, UN representatives, uh, we send our ambassadors to the UN, and these people are appointed. They're not really um, directly elected by people. So we kind of lose throughout that channel this, uh, we lose um, the citizens' voices through that channel, where we see the bureaucratic interests and the national interests come into play and kind of distort what people actually see as, you know, the good policy uh, that they would like to see in the world. So um, the main consideration, of course, at the General Assembly is uh, efficiency due to its uh, soft power. So um, can only recommend action to be addressed by the Security Council. Uh, and yeah, that ties again to, of course, the uh, link between uh, democratic legitimacy and efficiency. So uh, the main problems with the General Assembly are that it needs a defined scope for action where it would have hard power. So uh, that would bring it towards a um, sort of United Nations Parliamentary Assembly where it have hard power in constitutionally delineated areas. So um, in the five areas, we would see a very uh, specific areas where it could actually have a role, where it could not just say, okay, all nation states have to impose a carbon tax, say, of a certain amount, um, or reduce emissions by a certain amount, uh, or be vulnerable to sanctions. These uh, types of uh, policies would all have to be embedded and respectful of this constitution and or minimal constitution that we all agree on so that we can actually tackle global governance issues um, when it's critical. There's also a legitimacy component based on the representativeness of uh, the world population. So rep representatives of the UN, as I said, are appointed, not elected. Um, and also, uh, the UN General Assembly works one country, one vote, which is not really uh, democratic in a way to say that Canada would have the same power at the General Assembly uh, as, or the same voice. Its voice would have the same weight, sorry, as China's voice at the General Assembly, just because of that population difference. Uh, United Nations Parliamentary Assembly also sometimes takes into account uh, some regional considerations. So um, we would probably uh, group some nation states together to have uh, one seat. So uh, we might see something along the lines of uh, Canada being uh, split in half, or Canada and the U.S. being split in half, and eastern provinces and states uh, and territories uh, uh, in Canada and the U.S. would share a voting group. And like what, so like you might see New York share a voting group with Ottawa, Toronto. And on the other side, we might see another voting group with the West where Vancouver might share a voting group with California. So uh, all of these uh, are you know, debated also within among world federalists. Some do want to see it as one country, one vote, but they want to have that direct channel where we have separate elections for our UN representative and we have separate elections for our uh, national government. Um, and yeah, of course, the last blow to this is um, when we're at the United Nations General Assembly, um, there is this idea that, yes, Canada might not be as legitimate or its voice might not have as much weight as uh, China. Uh, but at the same time, there is also the comparison of Canada and uh, North Korea, for example, where North Korea is authoritarian and it's, it doesn't have that democratic legitimacy, which Canada has. So every single vote at the United Nations General Assembly varies in terms of its democratic legitimacy. And that's what world federalists are trying to change. Uh, that concludes uh, my or a presentation, really. Um, I'd like to throw in a last uh, word um, to uh, for a call for anyone who wants to get involved. 
uh, we're hosting a World Federalist Conference where uh, it's a very similar principle to model United Nations, if any of you know what that is. Uh, it's typically uh, organized in colleges, universities, and high schools uh, where students uh, take on the role of a UN representative and they go into a body of the UN. So uh, say you might have uh, 15 students from different delegations um, or, or different universities, each representing one country and then sitting down and pretending to be uh, the Security Council. So we're taking that concept, but we're applying it to um, world federalist principles. So in a way we would have a security council committee uh, followed by a well, side by side with a uh, security council reform committee and the decisions of one would be seen in the rules of procedure of the other. Uh, another one would be a model uh, United Nations parliamentary assembly, which is something that uh, the world federalist movement um, Democracia Global in Argentina does very well. Yeah, uh, I'd also love it uh, to hear any of you, um, if you want to just send me a quick email, um, we have a lot of uh, employment and volunteer opportunities for any members who want to get active. Um, my email is there at the bottom. Yeah, thank you. So again, uh, Alex, thank you for raising our consciousness on, on some, some of the global solutions and possibilities that are out there. Uh, appreciate that. We, we do have some questions coming our way. Uh, one of the questions that I have here is, um, in, in, in the recent case where the U.S. has asked Putin to be tried for war crimes, uh, but then is one of the states that refuses to recognize the World Criminal Court. Uh, such demonstrations of, of uh, big bullying will be difficult, uh, just as difficult in a world federal parliament. How do you address that? Yeah, exactly. And that's uh, very much the criticism of world federalism about the current global governance structure, where if, you're, if you don't want to recognize the International Criminal Court, you're just not bound by it in any way. And uh, I mean, Russia is not the only one that doesn't recognize it. And it is one of the big criticisms that we see that the International Criminal Court tends to just try a lot of African leaders uh, and warlords um, just because those countries uh, go through a change in government and that government wants to see those warlords tried. So uh, it's very rare that the head of a nation state will be seen as tried by the International Criminal Court. And that is exactly actually one of our uh, proposed reforms for a, an International Criminal Court to be, uh, or a World Criminal Court, as uh, you typed it out, um, would be a binding on individuals in a way. So that would definitely fall in line with uh, any world federalist proposal to um, establish you know, a common ground across the entire world community where we all agree that no, the nation state does not have a say in this, right? Uh, if you're tried for war crimes, you're tried for war crimes as a human being, not as a nation state or uh, the leader of a nation state. Thank you. Um... Question two, how do we create the will for such a change to take place? Is it just a matter of public education or direct pressure directed at the UN? That's uh, one of the biggest challenges, of course, with world federalism is um, the, the great need to create a will across the entire communi world community for this. Right? Um, and and uh, the fact that we're seeing a lot of nationalist populists movements uh, take place and kind of destroy all this progress that world federalists tend to make in minor reforms to uh, in global governance, it, it kind of is discouraging. Right? Uh, so we tend to see this line where we're seeing nationalist populists take the lead um, and uh, this other stream of world federalism kind of forgotten. But down the line, we have to think also about how um, change takes place. So yes, public education, um, direct pressure directed at the UN, uh, targeting state actors like within the state. So uh, with the United Nations Parliamentary Assembly, we reach out to all 338 members of parliament uh, to seek their endorsement for a United Nations Parliamentary Assembly. We educate them on that. And um, a lot of people actually sign on to it. Um, Trudeau, Justin Trudeau was, it, it had signed on to it. And this also ties again to what you're saying. How do we create the will for such a thing to take place? As soon as Justin Trudeau became, it came to the head of the government of Canada, he immediately withdrew his endorsement of the United Nations Parliamentary Assembly. And that's a big problem. So yes, there, is, there isn't enough of a will for this to happen yet. 
But as change takes place, what did we have? So we had the League of Nations. The League of Nations, when it fell, we needed something to replace the League of Nations. And that happened through massive populism, which caused world wars. So it, that showed the failures of the League of Nations. And as we saw the failures of the League of Nations, it just became completely illegitimate and we had to scrap it entirely. When we scrap something entirely, we have to replace it with something new. That's how uh, any re regulation works. And global governance will never go unregulated, whether it's completely privately regulated or uh, regulated through a world federalist government, it will have some sort of regulatory body uh, or regulatory system, sorry. So after the League of Nations fell, of course, we were looking for what, uh, how to replace the League of Nations. And we came up with the structure of the United Nations uh, or the United Nations. And uh, what we're seeing now might lead to the fall of the United Nations down the line if things get as bad as they did uh, back in the day. And this, uh, the research aspect and the public education aspect of world federalism creates this, uh, establishes these principles that we can draw from later when we recreate an international order if we come to that point. If we don't, then it still takes, uh, it, it still has a minor influence in different areas of international reform. But I personally believe that it is extremely critical for us to start thinking of ways that we could reform uh, global governance without being impeded by the status quo and what is possible, what is not, um, in the sense that uh, the, the World Journal Court, uh, yeah, it's almost impossible to establish that because Putin will just say no. Um, but we need to think that you know, that should be a principle in our minds that we should abide by. And these principles will all come to light at the end uh, if ever there's a need for a direct reform. There's also not only nationalist populists which could break down the United Nations, right? Uh, there are other possible disasters. The global uh, financial crisis um, could have you know, completely reformed the way we saw um, you know, capital movements across the world community. Um, but uh, there's also the environment. The environment is probably one of the uh, most, uh, yeah, I know it's very sad to see the environment degrading, but it's one of the most promising aspects for people to wake up and realize that we need immediate reform and we need drastic reform to the United Nations. And I do think that that uh, has been uh, increasing slowly. Uh, not as visibly as nationalist populists, but there's always that 3.5 rule where if you get 3.5% of a population mobilized, then change will happen. And that's a very low number. So, uh, so to follow up on that, uh, specifically with Canada, have you seen an uptick or what, what's in, in within, within state players? Do you see uh, a reception to these ideas uh, or do you track them? Uh, uh, as you address these issues? Yeah, um, actually, uh, it's it's interesting because uh, it kind of goes back to this idea that, um, you know, with nationalist populists, it, it kind of shows us how there is a need for reform and there is a need for a change in the way we do things. So um, when we were uh, under uh, the Stephen Harper government, uh, there was definitely more... Um, there was more reception by uh, a lot of uh, members of parliament from different parties, even the Conservative Party. Uh, members within the Conservative Party uh, were more likely to endorse the United Nations Parliamentary Assembly just because they saw the direction that the country uh, or that our foreign affairs were going in as Canadians. And they saw that our reputation was going downhill. And that kind of uh, brought way to uh, Justin Trudeau's platform to bring the UN back uh, or bring Canada back in the spotlight at the UN bring it as a champion of human rights. And uh, now that that's happened, we're not seeing as much. So I'd say there is a bit less of um, a willingness for a, United, uh, for a uh, world federalist government uh, among um, members of parliament specifically, but that doesn't mean that it's the case for uh, citizens. It just means that citizens are not as concerned about the state of the international order, so they might not be as active in it. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question. Could a country's vote allotment be based, given based on its democratic freedom index? That's definitely an interesting proposal. And I guess, yeah, I guess that really uh, 
goes to my point about um, the difference in the legitimacy of the votes in, of different members of the United Nations General Assembly. I had honestly never uh, thought about that specifically and how that would play into a reform, but that's a very interesting idea, honestly, that um, I'd love to explore more. I I'm Excellent. sorry, I can't really give you an answer right now because I haven't looked into this before, but yeah. Okay, perfect, there's an idea. Uh, next question is, much public discourse these days get hijacked by conspiracy theories and, and the like. How can we inoculate the UN or any world government against this? Uh, do you have the language that might be included in a world constitution? Uh, I'm sorry. Um, so not... it's, it's, it's more like what the question is asking if, if with so much conspiracy theories of, of the world elite taking over uh, and to address basically the, 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 the nationalist populist uh, agenda where they're trying to fight against the, uh, the federalist uh, movement. How, how do you address that? What's, what's the language that you would use in a constitution that you would base your movement on that can lay to rest these, these uh, conspiracy theories? Yeah, um, and that's the thing. There's a, a lot of uh, taboo words in there that do yep. lead to a lot of conspiracy theories. Um, so um, one of the big things is world federalism. We face this big taboo of being labeled as people who argue for a global government that would just you know, completely replace any nation state. And we do get actually a lot of emails um, through our, uh, yeah, we do get some emails from people sometimes that you know, label us as uh, globalists. But that's actually very much uh, the contrary of what world federalists do. And we do make an active effort to avoid that link or that taboo, which is, as you say, like a conspiracy theory that ultimately we want a uh, global order which will quash any municipal jurisdiction, provincial jurisdiction, or na national jurisdiction especially. Uh, so we use a lot of language uh, to avoid the terms uh, globalist um, and world government. So we'll always say world federalist government uh, before that. And we'll always try to make it clear, as I did at the beginning of this presentation, to say that, you know, we do want to respect uh, national sovereignty. Sometimes even framing it to the point where, uh, I mean, I know a lot of people that used to support Trump and that I've uh, successfully convinced and that you know, have uh, joined uh, what I had created earlier at the University of Toronto, the Global Federal Association. A lot of the members of that organization were actually previous supporters of nationalist populists. And they were very, um, you know, closed off to the idea of globalization. But they saw that world federalism in a way protects national sovereignty. It protects any sort of global order from coming about. If the nations fails and these ideas aren't there to protect national sovereignty, then at the end, we might see a very dark, you know, global order come about. And that is true. And that is something that we all fear. And um, I think that's why it's very important for uh, world federalist organizations around the world to make it clear on that and to uh, establish uh, some common ground to say, yes, we need more, better global governance. We need more democratic global governance. We need more efficient global governance, but we have to respect national sovereignty and we have to uh, reform it in a way that like protects it. Um, has there ever been a movement to reform the UN? Uh, well, I mean, we would be a movement to reform the UN. Uh, there are plenty of movements to reform the UN. Um, but uh, I mean, uh, I don't know. How from, within, from within? Oh, Can, from within? Well, I'm just asking, could it come from within or is, has there been other bodies that have attempted to create reform? Yeah, uh, there are a lot of uh, resolutions uh, that are constantly passed on uh, trying to reform different parts of the UN. Uh, there are some proposals even for uh, the Security Council reforms to, uh, for the inclusion of some nation states for the inc uh, increases in uh, the number of its members. Um, I know there were also proposals, I think, for uh, Japan and India to get uh, permanent seats on that. So those would uh, be different from world federalism because we would prefer to see the abolition or the weakening of the veto uh, rather than the expansion to five or seven permanent members. But yeah, there are constantly a lot of uh, movements uh, within the UN and proposals within the UN to reform it. 
problem is they always fail if they have any significant change to it that yep. world federalists would agree with because of the structure where the security council would just deny it. Thank you. Um, next question I have is how would world federalism address the issue of war between nations? Um, that's uh, well, that is mainly the idea of, you know, war is illegal. Um, we all know that the problem is war is illegal uh, in the UN, but it still happens. And it doesn't mean that we'll necessarily take action to prevent that from happening. So um, ideally, we would have more democratic legitimacy to instore something along the lines of a United Nations uh, emergency peacekeeping. Uh, yeah, so uh, it, the United Nations Emergency Peacekeeping Service, which I discussed earlier very briefly, has a lot of variations itself within it. So I don't want to um, speak uh, way too specifically for some members, but some members go even to the extent of you know advocating for almost a um, kind of militarized uh, peacekeeping service to just enter into any nation where there is an act of aggression. So. Um, the idea is to uh, mainly get uh, make the UN capable to address these conflicts in whatever way possible. And one of those ways is, of course, to have a more, more robust peacekeeping force, which is also tied to its budget. The United Nations does not have the budget for that. And that's why we would need to uh, tie all those five categories together into one uh, coherent whole where we would have uh, some sort of taxation to provide funds for an independent peacekeeping force to intervene. Thank you. Um, I have um, a question that I have is, in the past, what examples, or not to put you in a spot here, but have there been examples uh, in the UN uh, where resolutions have not been respected uh, just because of the Security Council vetoes? Uh, you did mention the Russia situation, but have there been other major examples which, which shows the inefficiency built into the veto process? Um, yeah, I mean, um, we see uh, cases of it constantly. Um, the one that really comes to mind and the one that's been going on for all, almost uh, since the inception of the UN is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, where um, we see uh, almost a consensus across the international community to recognize the Palestinian state, um, but at the same time, there is almost no action by the Security Council to prevent any human rights abuses in uh, Israeli or Palestinian territory, um, because uh, the United States will, uh, of course, or Russia sometimes will just uh, give its veto to uh, Israel by extension. So you'll never really see any action there. The only type of action you'll see to prevent human rights abuses is by the Israeli state because they have total control there. They have unilateral action possibility. So when unilateral action is the only possibility and the state that is committing human rights abuses is in control of that unilateral action, you can't expect to see any resolution to that anytime soon. So the Israeli-Palestinian conflict will go on until we see any change in our global governance structure that makes us able to do it. Thank you. Um, I'm looking for any other questions. Shauna, do you see any other questions that I can, uh, that's coming our way? I've not seen any other questions at this point. Okay. Uh, so I guess uh, uh, we, can, we can throw, uh, if you have any comments uh, that you want to share, uh, that you want to bring uh, to Alex's attention, we're open to that too. Uh, while while you're doing that, I just want to uh, in in my grade six social science class, I remember one of the slogans that we painted up was uh, uh, "Think globally, act locally." After listening to you, uh, Alex, I feel there's 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 a value in reversing it, uh, which is uh, uh, think uh, think locally, but act globally, at least in terms of uh, organizations like yours. So hope uh, hope that happens. And uh, one of the questions that comes out of that is how how can uh, people contribute to, I know you mentioned at the, on the last slide that how to get in touch with you. Are there any, any ways that people can reach out to you to, to you know, uh, get involved? 
What's oh, the best yeah, way? Absolutely. So um, my email there, I'll, I'll put it in the chat as well. Um, but yeah, if you just send me an email, I'm going to uh, like I I always send this little templated uh, thing where you are supposed to rank your preferences for the five categories, rank them also in order of what you how you think they're important in the world. But um, that'll give me a better idea of what types of projects um, you'd probably be most interesting interested in. I'd also put you in contact with um, uh, one of the uh, branch heads of uh, the closest branch to you if you're in Canada, and uh, um, you could be involved uh, with uh, their organization of events and their own organization of projects, petitions sometimes, and uh, of course, you know, uh, they're always looking for uh, increasing the size of their own branches and their boards, if anything. Yes, uh, the more uh, voices you have the the maybe the better weight that it'll carry exactly thank you alex again for a, a very engaging conversation and uh, thanks also to the audience for your thoughtful questions because of the limitations of zoom i know we cannot applaud properly but i invite everyone to show your appreciation by using the clap uh, icon that you'll find in the reactions tab the bottom of your screen. Uh, again, uh, CFIC relies entirely on donations and memberships to allow us to bring you events such as these. Uh, please visit our website, centerforinquiry.ca, or email info at centerforinquiry.ca for more information about how to uh, become a member or make a donation. Again, those links are in the chat window. Uh, CFIC has many other ev online events and presentations also to get announcements about what's coming up. We invite you to join us on Meetup also. Again, the URL is in the chat window. Uh, one of the events that are coming up again over here is uh, that we are going to do next on June 5th is on green burials. Uh, more on that coming up. Uh, again, uh, thanks again to all who, who have attended and hope to see you soon. Thank you, Alex, again, once again, and to everybody. Have a fantastic day.